Welcome to Roundhouse Roulette, a Walker, Texas Ranger podcast. I'm Evan Dalton, here with my brother Adam. Hello. And our bro from another mo, Mr. Bob Leahy. Hey, how's it going? Now, normally we'd be recapping and reviewing one of the 200 existing Walker, Texas Ranger episodes randomly selected by Roundhouse Roulette. But today, we're super excited to bring you this cosmetically kicking bonus episode. Our special guest is makeup artist Corinne Bardunius, who, among other things, worked on the first four seasons of Walker, Texas Ranger. Corinne, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it's a, it's an honor. I think it's really cool what you guys are doing, paying homage to what we thought was a rinky-dink little TV show and ended up being this humongously popular, cra- I, crazy. Who yeah. knew? <laughs> A TV behemoth. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Some may say a juggernaut. <laughs> mm. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about how you uh, got into the biz and, and got started? Uh, how much time you got? Um, so <laughs> I actually grew up. I'm one of the five people that actually grew up in Los Angeles. Everybody else kind of just moved there. So I grew up in Los Angeles and I had no direction in high school. My plans when I was younger, I was going to be a ballerina, but at five, almost five, seven at the time, that wasn't really happening. Um, (laughs) So I stopped when I was 16 or 17 and, you know, made it through high school. But after that, I had no idea what I was going to do. I'd always loved hair and makeup and fashion, all that. Um, So I went one day with my best friend. She was an actress, dancer, model, singer, blah, blah, blah. And we were going to get headshots for her with this photographer. And the photographer was looking for somebody that could help her run her business and do makeup. And at my cocky 19 year old self said, well, I can help you, you know, probably help you run your business, but you know, I don't know how to do makeup. She said, well, go take this class and then call me when you're done. And I don't think she had any idea who she was fooling with because two weeks later I came back to her and said, okay, where's my job? (laughs) <laughs> like, what? so i worked with her for about a year and it was it was great because i we were pumping out the headshots with actors and i learned how to be very very quick which is very important when you're working on a set they don't want to wait on you and i sort of prided myself on the fact that i was good and quick yeah so i worked with her for about a year and then i floundered around for a little bit and then by that point people that i went to high school with started producing music videos so I quit that well, I had left her and started doing music videos. I mean, everything from rap to uh, I think I did a DJ Snake video. I think that <laughs> okay. was his name um, up to uh, Janet Jackson and Tina Turner. So like it ran the gamut of music videos. I would say one of my favorites was Cinderella. <laughs> that, do I have that right? Yeah. Cinderella. It was get the funk funk out yeah yeah right i know that's yeah (laughs) so i did lots of music videos and that sort of thing um a little bit of television and my next door neighbor was also a makeup artist he was mostly a special effects makeup artist and he was doing a movie called cage so cage was my very first movie i'm not sure you saw this blockbuster (laughs) yeah But it was, it starred Lou Ferrigno. Oh, Uh, absolutely. (laughs) And (laughs) it was special. I actually did it for free. Okay. uh, Just for the experience. And uh, at the end of the film, producer brought me in and I was like, ooh, did I do something wrong? And he said, no, we actually had about $500 left in the budget and we wanted to give it to you. And that time I was like, 500 bucks? (laughs) Yeah. Cool. (laughs) At least you didn't have to spray tandem green. So that's good. No, no. (laughs) What a nice guy, though. Super cool. So then that sort of, I don't know, parlayed into, you know, more work and and more work. And um, then I got a call from one of my closest friends who's also a makeup artist. And she said, hey, want to go on location to Texas? And I was like, hey, okay." (laughs) And we did. So we packed up her truck, uh, you know two girls worth of makeup trunks and all of that, everything that you would need for a movie set, um, two Rhodesian Ridgebacks and my cat. (laughs) And off we drive to Dallas. We had rented a place sight unseen and it was horrible. 
it's what's known as a teardown, meaning as soon as we moved out, they tore it down. Nice. Oh, wow. So I was going on location for three months and I stayed for four years. She left. She actually left about a month in to go home and have a baby. So, yeah. So she left and I was left holding the bag. What about the cat? Uh, the cat stayed. The, the Ridgebacks went with her. That cat traveled, man. He went, <laughs> he went from L.A. to Dallas to New York. And New York was his final resting place. Wow. So I found him in a parking lot in East LA. He was a baby, like a little baby covered in fleas. Come to find out he was a rag doll, which apparently is a very expensive cat. And only in LA. Yeah, exactly. I was doing a movie, <laughs> a TV movie with Craig T. Nelson and myself and uh, the other makeup artist and hairstylist were like washing the cat in the wash basin, the hair, you know, the hair basin in our trailer. And he's like, you know, even smaller now that he's wet. And Craig T now holds him. And this cat starts like nuzzling in his in his ear. It was the cutest. It was the cutest <laughs> thing. He never did it again. But that was Angelo, my cat. That was his claim to fame. He's nuzzled in Craig T. Nelson's ear. <laughs> it's got star power. Yeah, <laughs> it's got star power. <laughs> Shout out to Angelo. Exactly. <laughs> May he rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Um, so that. I guess shows us how you got connected up with uh, Walker Texas Ranger that production. Yeah. That must have been right after the pilot, or did you do the pilot as well? I did not do the pilot. We came in after they they shot the pilot. Um, they brought some of us in from LA, not a lot, but enough to piss people off. <laughs> yeah. um, and you know, we roll in, and I now remember this is early '90s, so I'm rolling in in my vintage dresses and my and my Doc Martens, and. I just did not get the Texas way of life and they did not get me. <laughs> and they also, you know, we had, we hired local seconds for the department, uh, meaning I don't want to call them assistants because they did just as much work as, as we did. Uh, they just, that just was their title, the seconds. And they were a little angry. My direct second was a little angry and rightfully so. Cause I was in way over my head. I had no business running a show that big. Thank God for her, because I would have failed epically if I didn't have her. Her name was Gail. She, I mean, she saved my ass multiple times, but that was only after she liked me. <laughs> so the key makeup artist is kind of the head of the department. Is that how that works? Yeah. And they brought you in as the key makeup artist from the get-go? No, they actually didn't. They actually brought my friend in, my girlfriend, Ashley, who's who I traveled to Texas with. She was very well experienced and I was not. So I came in as her second and uh, we found out while we were on the road that she was pregnant. So a month and a half in, she went home and I sat down with the production manager who the production manager handles everybody from the producer level down. Myself, hair and makeup and lighting and grips, all of the people that do the manual stuff. The line producer is responsible for the budgets and script supervisors, all of that. So I sat down with him and Ashley and he, his name was F.A. Miller. They had a long history together. And I sat down with him and said, uh, what, <laughs> what am I doing? And he said, you got this, mm. whatever you need, you let me know and we will make it happen. And if it were not for his words, I probably would have turned around and followed her home. But I had no good reason to go home. So I went, all right, let's do this. So I then became department head key makeup. And a lot of films, the makeup artist becomes the department head, unless it's a bigger budget. And then you have a department head for hair and the de department head for makeup. It just kind of depends on how the departments are set up. Now, I have to put a caveat in here. I did not do Chuck Norris's makeup. Not once, not ever. He had his own makeup artist okay. um, that I only recently found out that she passed away in 2016. Oh. Um, but she was with him for, I mean, she, I think she did every movie with him. She did his hair and his makeup. She did everything for him. We did everybody else. Stunt doubles, all the other actors. So and it was a big, I mean, you know, we had four regulars and then however many guest stars and old friends the old friends <laughs> the old friends yeah. the old the old friends that's awesome um we got to talk to uh mignon about her script supervising and she kind of started in craft services and then winded up being the lead script supervisor yeah i forgot about that 
Well, she's a bright girl and you have to be really organized. You have to be really, really organized. And she is yeah. so um, and she was so diligent. You have to be that for a script supervisor. I have ADD, so there's no way that I could have done it. You know, I'd, <laughs> I'd be off in five different directions as I usually was. You know, Texas is a big state, but it's a small film community, really tight knit. Uh, once you're in, you're in. But accepting people from the outside was a little hard for them because they couldn't uh, they didn't know or understand why they had brought us in. Uh, truthfully, I don't either. I think the only reason is because the line producer, F.A., came from L.A. Uh, so I think he wanted to bring some of his people in, which happens a lot. A little bit of solidarity. Solidarity, nepotism, whatever you want to call it. You know, <laughs> listen, I mean, that's how you, if you're if you're an independent contractor, you rely on those relationships. Yeah. That's your livelihood. That's showbiz. <laughs> that's showbiz, babe. <laughs> So do a lot of people get into this through the fashion world or is it a separate beast? Um, so here's the thing. I actually did kind of come into it on the fashion side because I did so many music videos. I mean, you were working with hair bands. I was working with hair bands. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't get bigger than that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm fine. Uh, I was trained for beauty makeup by a makeup artist. Her name is Kathy Jung. And she taught me everything I know about beauty makeup. I assisted her on Janet Jackson videos, huge things that, you know, I worked with her on. So she taught me a lot. I mean, I think some people go straight into doing makeup for film and television. I think most of the people I worked with in Texas, that's mostly what they did. I kind of came in through the side door with some beauty, which actually helped me in the long run because I became then well-rounded. We had a question from one of our fans here, but it's kind of... You kind of shot it down already, though. So. Oh, I did? This is from our friend of the show, Elena, and she uh, wanted to ask, as a lead actor, Chuck Norris must have had very specific expectations in regards to his makeup and would go into details. Was it difficult to keep up? And how was it working with him in general? Okay, so I will address the first part of it. Um, as I said, Elona was his makeup artist, and I would say, yes, he was very particular because he had without offending him well he had things that he was concerned about um so Ilona you took care of that you know very privately they had their own makeup trailer she made him happy he was very happy having her around him working with him was a dream usually <laughs> <laughs> i have two moments that it wasn't so much fun uh one time he took me down. <laughs> I'm standing there talking to him and I forget we were talking about something and all of a sudden, bam, bam, bam. And I'm flat on my back looking up at him and he's just smiling because that's Chuck Norris and he can just take you to the ground in a heartbeat. <laughs> oh, it's an honor. <laughs> um, and then the second time he got mad at me for something. I don't remember what it was. And he was pissed. And, you know, you don't talk to him when he's mad. And you let him, you know, go away. <laughs> no. And his way of apologizing, because he doesn't apologize. He's, he's Chuck Norris. He doesn't have to. <laughs> but he came over and he just put his arm around me. And, and I knew everything was good. But beyond that, he was a dream. I mean, he's kind-hearted. He's funny. You know, he's, he's funny in his own way, kind of dry humor. But he's just a good guy. You know, he's a family man. He loves his family. And he's got a big family. <laughs> it seemed like a lot of them worked on it too, right? Yeah. So was Aaron Norris kind of the Chuck Norris whisperer? Um, Aaron Norris is kind of Chuck Norris's alter ego. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where Chuck was a, a silent simmerer if he got angry, Aaron was the not so silent side of it. And I like Aaron. I liked him a lot, but he has a temper and you do not want to mess with. You just don't mess with the Norris boys. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, let it be known here, guys, we're not messing with you. Please don't come for us. <laughs> I would just lie on the ground and submit. Yeah. 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 I that's definitely. pretty much what you have to do. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Um, well, I mean, at the risk of Chuck Norris coming for me, I think there was kind of a conspiracy about Chuck Norris. Um, and I'm hoping that, I mean, I know you don't have direct confirmation of this, but you might have secondhand confirmation. So I'm just oh, going to dig in here. Yeah. All right, give it to me. I'm trying to get to the bottom of Chuck Norris's real hair color here. Our research department did a lot of work here. Yeah. This looks like he's got like a dyed mustache blonde. It looks like you can see his chest hair here. It doesn't match his hair. It looks dark. Well. He's not blonde. Yep. 
it and it was darker there. <laughs> I know. All right. I, I see where you're going with this. But then look, they have comic books for kids. As, as a and, redhead. Red. And blonde. <laughs> yeah. They can't decide what it is. What What is he? Is he ginger? Is he blonde? <laughs> they, they even have look at this they have like a really sketchy halloween costume right? so scary it's so yeah. scary that is so creepy yeah. that's the thing Where of people's nightmares Dude, I, yeah, I can very... never unsee that yeah. oh wait till you see the kid in it <laughs> oh my god that is that's special wow but they're different colors they've got a blonde one and they've got you know, uh, brownish, reddish one, and then yeah. See the one on that on the right. That's the truck that I know, but that's even a little darker. Yeah, yeah, so that's, little that's definitely dyed right there. Today yeah. he's still dying it. So well, he definitely there was definitely some hair color happening there. Okay. Um, I think as a little boy, I think he was blonde. I could be wrong, but I think he was more blonde when he was little. Okay. I don't know how that parlayed into being a ginger and being a redhead i think it might have just been the dye job that his people did <laughs> you think he was just experimenting uh probably you know let's change it up a little kind of a thing okay uh and then i i think his makeup artist his you know hairdresser would you know jump on that and do what she thought was best i'm trying to be very yeah. kind here can you tell <laughs> oh, no. it was the 70s you know farrah fawcett was in yeah, yeah. It's the real that's deal. Probably, probably, you know? That's yeah, probably what he was going after. Yeah, I think. And also, you know, kids on the playground, they all want to pretend to be Chuck Norris. He's like, yeah. well, I don't want just the blonde kids to be able to be me on the playground. I want yeah. the gingers. <laughs> right. I want the brunettes. Exactly. I hear you. I see so, where you're going with this. So yep. I think he, yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, it wasn't all vanity. <laughs> <laughs> no. Once he came out of the makeup trailer, his vanity was gone. He just was, you know, he was. In his element. Okay. So in the makeup trailer, did they also, I mean, they also coiffed his hair as well? Um, yes. So his hair was done. His makeup was done. He had a separate trailer. So his hair and makeup was always done in the other trailer. But yes, it was colored and styled and, and all that. Uh, with his stunt doubles, we had to kind of guess what she was going to do. Wait, wait. So she I'm going always... to stop you right there because you didn't do Chuck Norris's hair, but you did. Because you did a stunt doubles. Yeah. <laughs> so you kind of lied to us. We did a stunt double. I didn't, do, I didn't yeah. touch his actual head. Okay. Okay. Well, you did Walker, Texas Rangers hair. The character. True. The character. The character. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. I see, right, I see what you're doing. I know yeah. I'm splitting hairs here, but. I, huh. Oh, no. <laughs> Is he always like this? Yeah. yeah. He's worse. Yeah. <laughs> normally. Yeah. I'm trying to tone it down here. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tone uh, it down on my account. <laughs> so, as someone who um, hasn't done much of a wearing of a uh, you know a cowboy hat, although <laughs> I have worn my fair share of baseball caps, and I know that if you've got your hair looking real nice, and then you put on a baseball cap and take it off, you know you kind of have to redo your hair again. But I don't think I've ever seen anyone on the show with hat hair. Did they do uh, shoots where they were all wearing hats and then they had to do reshoots after the hat came off? I don't think we reshot things. I think it was just sort of like a, you know, if the hat came off, it was a cut. And then it was, you know, fix the hair and let's get back to it. That kind gotcha. of a thing. Okay. Um, we didn't really reshoot anything necessarily. All right. So on set, did you guys consider chuck norris's haircut to be a mullet or no because it's kind of in, in the gray zone right uh i don't know that the actual conversation of a mullet came up um ironically my son my 15 year old is growing a mullet and it's just killing me but <laughs> now i don't think we actually had the conversation that it was, that his hair was a mullet it was just you know like i said you know it it was what it was i think it was pretty normal for that time yeah, yeah and it wasn't so long that it became a mullet uh, right but it was just long enough that now we're like, oh, man, that's in dangerous territory. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, you right. know, she kept it curled up, curled under enough, yeah. you know, so it, it didn't get it didn't get too out of hand. OK. OK. All right. <laughs> All right. This this helps me. Thank you. Thank oh, you. you're welcome. I'm, I'm, I'm here to I'm, I'm here to serve. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Um, well, so obviously you had a lot of time in the chair with a bunch of different actors and um, I'm sure you got all the deets. So we need to hear it. What do you got? Oh, you want me to spill the tea, <laughs> so to speak? That's what the kids say these days. Yeah, that yeah. is. That's what I yeah. heard. The I hot heard that. tea. Um, uh, let's see. 
All right. So let's start at the top with Trevette. So Clarence Gilliard is a brilliant actor. Really, really good. Took his job very, very seriously. He and I had a love-hate relationship. We (laughs) loved like brother and sister and fought like brother and sister. Now, you're not really supposed to fight with your actors because my job is to take care of them. But he would do things like um, he would go for a run. He was in sick shape. And he would go for a run at lunch. And he would come into my trailer after lunch for touch-ups directly from his run. So he'd be sitting in my makeup chair sweating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you guys probably don't know much about makeup, but I'm going to tell you something. Trying to put makeup on a sweaty man (laughs) doesn't really work. I believe that. I believe that. That's why I never wear makeup, because I'm always sweating. I believe you. I believe you. (laughs) So, you know, I would kind of be like, you know, and then they'd be knocking on my door. Where is he? And I'm like, what do you want me to do? He came in. He's all sweaty. I got to wait. And then I'm like, why are you doing this to me? So we had this, you know, love hate relationship, but it was much more love than than hate. You know, he was just a an intense, intense guy, but really, really good actor. Um, Cherie J. Wilson cannot say enough good things about her. I'm still uh, in touch with her. You know, mostly social media, but every once in a while, there's the you know the little hi babe, how are you? I think the kids from L.A. became very tightly knit um, because we didn't know anybody else, so we all kind of banded together and spent a lot of our time together. I spent some Thanksgivings and Christmases at her house. And um, ironically, she was on Dallas and she played the sister to another one of my very, very close friends who also is an actress. They played sisters on Dallas. So when I came to the show, I met Cherie and I said, Kimberly Foster is one of my best friends. And it was like, you know, worlds colliding. So, um, yeah, I can't say enough about her. Um, Noble Willingham. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) God bless him. Colorful character. Colorful. uh, Yes. We'll go with that. Yeah. Pain in the ass. Let's go with that. (laughs) A curmudgeon. Uh, A curmudgeon. Good one. (laughs) Um, no, you know what? He was cool usually, but you know, he was, he just didn't put up with anybody's bullshit. Mm. I can't blame him. I mean, he, he was probably just pissed that they always put him in these extremely high pants. Oh, my God. The pants yeah. and the suspenders. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, who could blame the guy? You know, know. honestly. <laughs> yep. That mustache was real, though. Mustache was real. I don't think I could have replicated that. <laughs> uh, um, but we had some really awesome guest stars on the show. We had Carol Burnett's daughter was on the show uh carrie she was awesome it's been amazing yeah for us just even going through and like oh wow that actor was on this you know yeah. it's, a, it's we did pretty yeah insane. the same thing same thing and they would be really a nobody um specifically some kids would come in yeah you said your friend did the makeup for the spider-man movies and this is yeah. uh toby mcguire the spider-man himself was on one of the episodes what episode was that what season was that uh, the Prodigal Son. That's right. Yeah. Season two. Yeah. So you were on that. I was on that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Doris Roberts was another one. She was amazing. I think. Didn't she play uh, Ray Romano's mom? Yeah. Was yeah. that the Bingo Bamboozle? That episode? Something like that. It's that it's sounds insane. Familiar. They yeah. made her like the villain of the episode. Yes. Uh, we, <laughs> it's really <laughs> weird. <Yeah. laughs> I got to work with her a couple of times and she was amazing. She was awesome. Um, yeah, we haven't got to that yet, but I, I'll look forward to seeing that one again. Yeah, we did um, the Road to Black Bayou with uh, David Huddleston of the Big Lebowski fame. Yeah. Talk, uh, another pair of high pants and suspenders right there. <laughs> yeah, yep. I'm going to have to talk to Sabina about that one. <laughs> she was the costume designer. Maybe we should get her on here next time. <laughs> yeah. I'm in, yeah. She's got some questions to answer. <laughs> <laughs> she was really in the high pants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you had mentioned that you did um, some kind of aging makeup on Clarence Gilliard for an episode. What was that all about? Wow. Um, we had to age him and I can do, you know, cuts, bruising, that, that kind of thing. But when it comes to the major stuff, I brought in the big guns and I brought in my friend, Bill Meyer, 
who did the Spider-Man stuff. So whenever I could, I would bring him in to do the, the heavy duty stuff. So I always learned watching him. I mean, it's, it, there is a true artistry in special effects and prosthetics. And he is a genius prosthetic makeup artist, but it was, you know, the work was really, really good. And the producers submitted us for an Emmy nomination, which we did not get. And, uh, you know, we move on. So I, that's my claim to fame. I was submitted for an Emmy nomination, yeah, which means absolutely nothing. <laughs> no, no. I mean, that's, 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 that's a byline right there. No, so, all it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All it meant was that the producers liked our work. That's all. So that's fine. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And I guess, you know, I don't know what Clarence Gilliard was doing, like if they went back in time or uh, maybe it was one of the old West episodes and he played somebody else or something. That's the only thing I could think of. It's embarrassing that I don't remember, but four years. And I think at that time we were doing how many episodes a year did we do? Do you guys know how many episodes a year we did? It's like 22 to 25 a year or something like that. Yeah. Times know. four. So that was a lot of episodes yeah. it, and no one does that anymore. No one does 22 episodes anymore. No, and you're saying you guys were coming in every week for a new episode. Yeah, we would shoot. I think we did an episode every seven days, every seven film days. Uh, we also, at the same time, would have a B unit, meaning um, stunt doubles, the car crashes, the explosions, all that stuff was a full crew as well. So it was a big production. And being in it, you don't realize quite how big it is until you look back and go, holy shit, we blew up houses. I mean, we literally like bought like these houses that were, they were going to demo them. And our locations department found them and said, yeah, we're going to buy them and then we're going to blow them up. And we blew up houses. That's where I thought you were going when you were talking about the house you just moved into when you got there. I was like, oh, I wonder if they blew that up. <laughs> I should have offered that one yeah. uh, to blow up. Yeah, there's that one episode blown apart where it literally looks like you guys blow up a whole neighborhood in real life. That's got to be that episode, right? That's the one. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the one. Yeah. It was, yeah, we bought these houses and blew them up. That was outrageous. That's one of our top rated episodes, I think. It was really? so insane. Yeah. Probably because they blew up the neighborhood. And yeah. the bad guy was out of control. <laughs> the villain in that one was um, pretty exceptional. I got to go back and watch these now. Uh, I do have one fun story that I thought you guys might find interesting. I got a phone call one day from extras casting. Now, extras are the people that you see in the backgrounds and, and all that, right? Got a phone call from extras casting and she said, listen, can I come and talk to you? Sure, I'm in my trailer. So she came in and she said, listen, I have this friend and he's an FBI agent. Uh, uh. Okay. <laughs> and they want to talk to you about doing something for them. Uh okay <laughs> <laughs> so they came in and they had a case where there was a hit out on somebody and they were going to set up the person who they knew who had put the hit out totally out of the movies they knew who <laughs> had put the hit out and they wanted to um set him up so they wanted to know if i could make the guy who had the hit on him look like he had been shot in the head and dead so you know, sure, why not? Uh, <laughs> really, I, I mean, man, I was cocky. I don't know what made me think that I could, but I did a whole lot of research and the hit was very specific. He had to be buried in a shallow grave. Uh, he had to be shot in the head with, I forget what caliber it was. It was a small caliber. I don't know why small, but, um, and I did it and I can't find the pictures. I know I have pictures. Uh, but I can't find them. I was trying desperately to find them. Well, this sounds like a plot line ripped out of a Walker episode, first of all. Yeah, I know, right? I, mean, I can't believe they didn't write this into an episode. What, talk, what were they thinking? Yeah. Talk about some morbid research, too, huh? Yeah. Yes, very much so. <laughs> yeah. I think very if you were so. going to be doing that research now, you better hope that the FBI knew you were doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was no Google back then. So if memory serves, I went with them to... Well, the first of all, they brought photos with them. I don't remember a library, but I remember going and seeing like photos everywhere. You killed people, didn't you? <laughs> Not physically. <laughs> I okay. made them look dead. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Sure. So very long story short, we won. They won the case. It was so good. It was so believable. 
the, the guy who put the hit out did not believe. And the jury did not believe that he wasn't dead. They showed pictures. They used the photographs in the court case. And the jury had a hard time believing that the guy was not actually dead because I did such a good job. Wait, wait, I don't, I didn't follow that. Okay. I know it was a little convoluted. You made an FBI agent look like he was shot in the head. Um, he was not an FBI agent. He was a bad guy. Okay. Who had a hit out on him. So okay. I made him look like he had been shot in the head. I gave them a big, huge jug of fake blood. <laughs> oh, and yeah. I said, just pour it everywhere. Uh, I did a bullet hole in his head and I, yeah. you know, I, I did a whole lot of dead body makeup. And then they put him somewhere. They took him. They put him in a shallow grave. They poured the blood and they photographed him. Okay. They then, whoever was supposed to do the hit, went back to the crime boss and said, we're done. Okay. And then he was arrested. And then the photos were used in the court case, the photos of the dead body. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Excellent work. It is excellent work. And I actually, they, (laughs) fun fact, when you call the FBI, they answer the phone, FBI. Mm. (laughs) I would have thought they would answer Joe's Pizza. No, they answer it, FBI. (laughs) How do I know? Because I called them. (laughs) I needed to call in a favor. Oh, oh, okay. When I left. And that's how I know that when you call the FBI, that's how they answer. (laughs) So they didn't pay you. They just said, here's our card. Let us know if you need a favor. Pretty much. Oh, it's like a movie. Pretty much. Yeah, I great. got a t-shirt. Oh, I got cool. a t-shirt and I think a hat or something. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> I just thought it was cool. I mean, I certainly wasn't going to ask for, you know, I, I just thought it was cool. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. That's my exciting story. <laughs> <laughs> Can you kind of explain to us, you know, how you broke up with Cordell Walker for Carrie Bradshaw? What's up with that? <laughs> so I had been in Texas for close to four years and I went on hiatus. I went home and my best friend was getting married and she was marrying my now husband's best friend from college. So my husband and her husband went to college together. So I met him on this hiatus. I met my now husband. It was love at first sight and we were done. So I had nothing really keeping me in Dallas. I had been there for four years and I, you know, I was like, all right, I'll move to New York. So we had just started the fourth season and I was saving all my money up because I was moving to the big bad city. I didn't tell anybody for a while. And I, um, I remember going into Chuck's trailer. Now, Michael had, <clears throat> my husband is Michael. He had come out multiple times. So everybody knew him. Uh, everybody really liked him. And I remember going into Chuck's trailer because I had to have the talk with him. So you literally did break up with Cordell Walker. I literally broke up with him. Well, I think what I did was I moved out of the house. Oh, okay. I left the nest. All right. I, I, I left the nest. <laughs> he was very gracious about it. He was very kind. And he said, if he doesn't take good care of you, let me know and I'll take care of him. <laughs> Some, something, something to that effect. It, you know, he meant it in jest, but he kind of yeah. didn't. Uh, he and his brother and actually Aaron was in there in the trailer as well so I told them at the same time so no they really liked they really liked him but they were very protective we were a very tight-knit group so you know I packed up all my stuff and my cat Angelo (laughs) (laughs) and uh, Michael flew out and we drove from Dallas to New York in the city my husband is from New York he's from Long Island which is where we live now but I moved into the city because that was going to be better for work purposes for me. And I sort of hit the ground running. I just, um, I didn't really have any connections. I had a a roommate set up, friends of friends. I really had no connections for work. I mean, it was a ballsy move, if I do say so, because I knew nobody. And I just started knocking on doors. I just started researching and and, um, looking up production companies and, and knocking on doors and saying, can I come in and show you my book? Can I come in and show you my resume? And it didn't really pan out until... Uh, you called the FBI for a favor. Well, yeah, I called the FBI. I, I met somebody who introduced me to somebody and it ended up being John Panati, who's He's become a pretty big producer. I actually just saw his name on something. He was producing a film called Illuminata with John Turturro and his sister Aida Turturro was in it and Beverly D'Angelo. The cast was amazing. 
so I, you know, John Panati had this friend who was a makeup artist who I ended up working for her for quite some time. She wanted to design the, the, the makeup, but she couldn't do the film. She was doing something else. So she sort of interviewed me and approved me to do her design because some of it, it uh, Illuminata was very stylized. It took place in the early 1900s. So there was some beauty aspect to it. There was a lot of different little things that went into it. So she approved me. We met, she approved me. And um, so she was the makeup designer and I was the key makeup. And um, it just kind of went from there. So when you're an independent contractor, you listen to what people are talking about on a set and you listen to where their next job is. And you immediately get on the phone and call that production company and say, can I send your resume? You know, you go from one to another to another. Sometimes you have to leave a job early if one show is starting, you know, a week early. It's never great, but it happens. And I was doing a, a movie with Mickey Rourke and I kept hearing about this show, Sex in the City. And I was like, sex in the city. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, you know, all right, what's the number? The, I'll, I'll call the production. And I get on the phone with the production manager. And she says to me, Corinne, we were just going to call you. Mm. And I was like, hmm. Well, apparently I pulled the same number that I did moving from LA to Dallas. I pulled the same number moving from Dallas to New York when I ended up getting this job. So they apparently had interviewed about 30 makeup artists and I was the 31st makeup artist and my beauty background served me well because they wanted somebody who could run a makeup department, but who also knew about beauty and fashion and all of that. So I did not interview with the producers or anything. I interviewed with Sarah Jessica Parker and Pat Fields in Pat Fields loft, which was sick. <laughs> So I went to her loft and Sarah Jessica interviewed me and it obviously went very well. And um, about a week later, I got a phone call from somebody and said, you just pissed off a whole lot of people, girl. And I was like, I just moved here. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, it's cutthroat. So yeah, I, I uh, flew the coop from Texas and, um, and joined a crazy ride. I believe it. Um, yeah. I, uh, I'm just going to say it. Um, I've definitely seen every episode of Sex in the City, so <laughs> just starting out there. I'm just going to come clean here. All right, um, all right. Full disclosure. Yeah, I'm not going to make excuses. I'm just going to say I, I have seen it. And um, listen, real men watch Sex in the City. Yeah, just I'm just saying. Yeah. And uh, I made the mistake. I outed myself because someone was talking about like the pilot episode. I was at work and I was like, "Oh yeah, the pilot episode is a different format than the rest of the series." And I was like. Why did I just say that? <laughs> yeah. I came in after the pilot. So how long did you work on that? I only did the first season. I gave literally blood, sweat, and tears. Lots of tears. It was a tough show because it's four women that sometimes, you know, had to be ready at the same time and four big personalities. I had worked with Kim Cattrall before that, probably five years earlier, before I moved to Texas, I had worked with her. So that was good. There was a little, you know, icebreaker there. And Sarah Jessica and I got along very, very well. But the dynamic was was different on that show. I was brought in to run the makeup department because they knew I could and they liked the eye that I had for beauty. But Sarah Jessica had her own makeup artist and he had never done makeup on a film before. So I had to teach him how to do it. And I was it was a whole Megilla. I was resentful about that, uh, you know, coming clean. Sounds stressful. Yeah. Yeah. It was drama from the get go. There's no doubt. Well, I was going to ask this anyway, but now I have to. Um, so who is a bigger diva? Sarah Jessica Parker, Kim Cattrall, uh, Kristen Davis, Cynthia Nixon, or Chuck Norris? Oh, wow. So take Cynthia out of the equation. She was not a diva whatsoever. Okay. Um. Sarah Jessica was not a diva. She just knew she was the boss. She okay. was quietly the boss. She was a silent producer that She's first like, year. You're, you're the reason I'm here, but she didn't say it. But she, exactly. You knew it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, she and I had many, many very private conversations where she shared quite a bit. So I, I was privy to a lot of stuff. So she didn't outwardly portray that. Uh, let's see. Chuck was not a diva. 
I don't think. No, he wasn't a diva. It's really, I mean, it's a toss up between Kristen and Kim. Kim was one of the last contract actors for the studios. So movie studios used to give actors contracts years ago. And she was one of the last divas, if you will, to get a contract. (laughs) So she was a diva in her own right. And she worked it. I liked her very much. We got along very, very well, but she had a personality. And Kristen, I got along very well with Kristen. There's really, there was nobody I didn't get along with. I liked some of them better than others. I'm guessing Kristen's not going to hear this so I can share this. Okay. But uh, there was one, (laughs) one. (laughs) We're going to have a lot of Sex and the City fans coming in for this one, I think. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Most definitely. Let's just say that Kristen didn't feel important and she made it known one evening that she did not feel important. And it was comical. We'll leave it at that. (laughs) Okay. It was kind of funny. That's such a Charlotte move. It really was. (laughs) Mm, 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 mm. So uh, needless to say, though, of all the divas, only one uh, threw you to the ground. Yeah. Only one threw me to the ground. Yep. (laughs) All right. I'm going to take that at the Chuck is probably the the most diva out of the bunch there. (laughs) All right. That's the way I'm I'm choosing to read it that way. That's how you're rolling. Okay. I got you. (laughs) Yeah, so those two shows like are so diametrically opposed, um, you know. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, in a way, they're both extreme in different ways, you know. Yes, very much so. We had a g- I had a good time on Sex and the City. It was a lot of work. We worked really long hours. We worked most Saturdays. We would start at six o'clock at night on a Friday and work until six in the morning or eight in the morning on a on a Saturday morning. I remember we were on a rooftop in New York City, downtown New York City, three o'clock in the morning, pouring rain. And we all kind of looked at each other and said, is this that whole glamorous part of the movie industry that people (laughs) love that they want it, that they they think we're so it's so glamorous? Yeah, not so much. (laughs) It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of hard work. Oh, man. Um, Oh, yeah, I guess I should have asked this earlier, but maybe you can give us some like clickbait gossip about the parker and kim cattrall online spat i got nothing and and i'm not i'm I'm not i'm talking about cd parker of course (laughs) (laughs) so you know there's a a bunch of rumors about the two of them and maybe you could clear it up here again i mean you uh, sat down with uh, noble willingham for a long time you didn't dish about this (laughs) i uh listen i've been sworn to secrecy okay i've been i've been sworn to secrecy i you know i I take my stories to the grave. All right. I'm I'm reading there's something happening there. Noble Willingham, Kim Cattrall, you know, there's something there. Internet. (laughs) Find it. Okay. Somebody find it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So excellent. We've got our clickbait gossip. That's good. Check. Good. Um, So uh, what are your thoughts on the, I guess there's like a, not a reboot of Sex and the City, but a revival, right? Do you care or what? I kind of don't care. No, I've, I kind of, I kind of don't care. Yeah. I, I see no need for it. I feel like they did it very well. They did the movies very, very well. Let it go. Let it go. They yeah. certainly don't need the money. Um, I know Kim's not coming back. I know Chris Noth is not coming back. Mr. Big. I don't know why they're doing it, but the fans want it. Yeah. Obviously. I think it would be a better thing to do it like the friends reunion do it as a round table reunion sort of a thing. I think that would be awesome. People always want to see actors and, you know, in their, who they are as people. And yeah, you know, I have been asked before what, you know, what's so-and-so like, what's so-and-so like? my kids, my kids know what I, what I did, but they still sometimes go like my, my older one, my 17 year old, he'll ask me if I worked with com- this comedian or that comedian or, you know, or, if I, whatever actor I worked with, like, I'll say, Oh yeah, I worked with him. <gasps> what was he like? Was he nice? People always want to know yeah. if somebody was nice or, you know, fun to work with or I, really only, I think I only have one person that I ever really, truly disliked, like mm. really, truly disliked. Is that one going to your grave too? Yeah. That one has to go to my grave. Yeah, it, it was fair, Rod, fair, Stewart, right? Rod Stewart, right? Rod Stewart. 
No, I didn't work with him. <laughs> okay, That'd be a just, good one, though. That hair would be impossible to attain. Oh, man. To tame that, that oh, mane the would hair. be. Oh, yeah. the hair. The I just want to, I would like, get my hands in that hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm working on my Rod Stewart cut. Um, Are you? So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't you know. got the. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I haven't, it's been a while, but um, I mean, just asking for a friend, do you have any like hair care advice or like skin care for someone who doesn't do anything at all? No, it's, that ship has sailed. Oh, yeah. Really, <laughs> that ship has All sailed. Right. <laughs> All right, and that's your tip. Uh, tip of the episode. That's, uh, that's my tip. Yep. Out there, okay. Yep. <laughs> Professionally speaking, yeah, it's 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 not happening for you, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Just give up. So what uh what do you got going on these days? So what am I doing these days? Um, I am a mom to two boys, fifteen and seventeen. And I have been lucky enough to be a stay-at-home mom with them. So when they were younger, I would do maybe one or two films a year. Uh, so I would do that. And in particular for two actors that I'm very close with, I would do with them. My kids started getting older and I was mom. But now that they're in high school, I have started with two of my best girlfriends have started a blog called The Ladies Room. And... I'm hoping you have a lot of female Walker fans here and Tons. they all know <laughs> yeah. that the best conversations go down in the ladies room. They never let me in there. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> I'll, I'll say the conversation in the men's room, something that should stay there probably. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. All right. All right. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. So this was, you know, the brainchild of two of us. And then we brought on our third partner and, We've been having a lot of fun and it's gaining momentum. We're working hard to get it off the ground. We talk about everything from marriages, divorces, kids, um, everything, you know, that takes up a lot of our, a lot of my time. Um, life is good. That's life awesome. is good. I like it. So yeah, that's it. That's uh, that's my story. Awesome that's my story. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for, for sharing it with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, yeah. Been fun. I, uh, it's been a nice little trip down, down memory lane for me as well. You know, 20 years, 20 something years. It's a long time. You know, sometimes it feels like it hasn't been that long. And then I, I think of everything that I've done in between. I'm like, wow, that was, really was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is kind of like a, the show has definitely been a time capsule too for us, you know? Well, so uh, if people want to find you online, you'd say uh, go to the ladies room. So our Instagram handle is at the ladies room NY and our website is www.theladiesroom.net. Come check it out. Honestly, you know what? It's, it's a lot of fun. There's, um, you know, I, I never knew that I liked to write until I started writing blogs. Um, there's, you know, there's some interesting stuff. Like I wrote a big blog on uh, my past, you know, the history of work and all that. And, and then there was one about an ex-boyfriend that um, died. Hmm. So, I mean, it runs, really, it runs the gamut. We got some stuff coming up too that we're working on. So join us in the ladies room, guys. Awesome. <laughs> It'll probably be the only ladies room you can get into. Right. I was gonna say, it's <laughs> on the internet, right? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we'll definitely put a link to that on the episode page for this podcast. Very cool. This was great. I had a good time. Thanks, oh, guys. Yeah. No, likewise. Um, you make it easy. I, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that was fun. I know we certainly learned a lot about the uh, character arc of a makeup artist. Indeed. And listeners, we hope you'll join us next time when we return to our normal format, recapping and reviewing another bone-crushing episode of Walker, Texas Ranger. In the meantime, please share your opinions with us on social media and leave us a review wherever you get your podcast. It truly helps other Walkerites find the cast. Most importantly, we thank you for listening. Until next time. Oh, wait. Corinne, would you help take us out? May the eyes of the Ranger be upon you. You're in Texas, look behind you Oh, cause that's where the ranger's gonna be